Here's another problem. Students generally don't work during business hours. I don't know what they do sometimes. <laughs> you know, like, they sleep in. Um, hello everyone, I'm Rachel and you're listening to the Echo Podcast. Today we have the opportunity to speak with Hayden Smith about his life in general, but also about the startup space and his endeavours into the education sector. So Hayden, please introduce yourself and a bit about what you do. Uh, yeah, my name's Hayden Smith. I'm a computer science graduate from UNSW. I'm currently a co-founder and CTO of Perla, which is a retail investing company based in Sydney. I also teach casually at UNSW for a number of undergraduate and also partly postgraduate courses. Cool, cool. Okay, so just to ease off into the podcast, um, we'll ask some general questions. So you're currently working on a lot of different things at the moment. Um, how do you do it? From managing startups to teaching at UNSW, how do you maintain that work-life balance, if you have any? Yeah, it's a good question. There's, there's a lot to unpack there. I think, you know, probably firstly, I don't really drink. I don't really spend a lot of time with family that kind of frees up for most people a day a week at least sometimes yeah. too so you know that's a huge element to it like a lot of things in life you just get better at things over time you get better at focusing you get better at figuring out where your limits are you don't push yourself as hard you know i go back to uni and i used to work really hard but then i get really sick you know oh. um, and then i'd like lose a week and that would screw everything up and then i'd you know like really struggle with stuff and i don't think i've really been managing multiple things in my life extremely well probably until i was like 26 years old you know what i mean so oh. the point of that is that um i don't like when you know i kind of get asked these questions from kind of random people and they're kind of looking for like a a hint most of it's just you know be motivated to do your best and just keep figuring it out and it'll take a lot of years sometimes so you would say it's just more of like a oh you learn as you go there is no shortcut you just gotta experience it yeah, yeah, exactly. Because um, there's a lot of little things like, you know, I take my laptop to a lot of places. A good example is um, I like to do work when I can't do more fun things. Say I'm going out to dinner with a friend. I'm like leaving the house and I'm literally just going to the city to have dinner. Like I'll take my laptop with me to work on the train, but it's not just that. It's like what happens if you get to the train station and you miss a train or, you know, there's like train delays. It's like another 15 or 30 minutes. That's time that you don't have to spend at home later on, you know, working on it. There's like a lot of micro adjustments in, in that regard. My workspaces as well. I try and be very comfortable at my desk. I try and feel like I have the tools set up to actually get a lot of work done. Sometimes I think I'm just like really motivated. But then, for instance, you know, I'll go to visit my family and I'll be on my laptop instead of, you know, at my desk with my bigger computer. And I'll just get like nothing done for a day. And I'll be like, oh, OK, you know, you're not some genius, right? You're just, you know, you, you are your tools to some extent as well. Thank you for your hot tip, but not a hot tip. Um, so <laughs> as somebody who has been at UNSW for quite a while, what opportunities do you think we should be aware of and really grasp as current UNSW students? There's this thing that happens to you somewhere in your early 20s where you, you start to not want to do things for free anymore. It usually <laughs> happens once you kind of get a job then it gets worse as you get like further in your 20s and you start thinking maybe I need to buy a house one day or maybe depending on your disposition you'd like to have kids but you need this incredible time where you're happy to like just do stuff for nothing like you just want to learn and I think probably as much as you can possibly do you know without impacting yourself financially or mentally just do a bunch of stuff that you wouldn't do later in life like there's obviously the topical thing like oh you know you could join a startup but even more just you know student groups, student societies, random projects, even just like teaching yourself how to play an instrument or something. Because I, I find as you get older, you, be, you, you kind of, you're forced to really think about what you're doing. I can't just waste a Sunday learning something. I, I have responsibilities. So um, take advantage of that time because it's a very sweet, short period of life in a big way. Yes, that's very true. And I think like you generally wouldn't have the same amount of like energy and passion or oh, passion I don't know about passion but um, so in terms of personal projects but just in projects in general that you've been involved in are there any you would have liked to spend more time on or are you just more like this is it um I mean I'm probably pretty obviously most proud of the time I spent with Sunswift I mean the shirt's not related to that it's just a oh. you know 
they're hot days and it's a comfy t-shirt um and i like black a lot generally uh, you know there's some things i thought about a bit sometimes i wondered if i wanted to be part of student societies probably not i think there can be a bit too much bs in some of the societies i think i wish i did it maybe more socially than anything i think i was very like work oriented at, at uni i very much wanted to do cool things rather than like meet cool people like you meet cool people through doing cool things but i don't want to spend you know my late teens and early 20s like go into clubs and pubs and um, board games and stuff i'm not saying they're bad i'm just a idiot more like i i wanted to you know learn stuff or tinker with stuff or i'd see people be like we're gonna launch a satellite and i'd be like oh that sounds so much fun i'd love to launch a satellite too can i come along but probably the main thing i wish i spent more time on earlier on was like things that were a bit more technical you know you could imagine like a really good example is like say an exec in cse soc they spend a lot of their spare time dealing with like administration and management and leadership and hr and they're all amazing skills that most of us lack but I kind of got towards the end of uni and I was like, God, I could be a much better engineer than I am. You know, like I really wish I'd spent that 10, 20, 30 hours a week doing more like actual technical things in my spare time. Um, Cause like, I never want to be one of those people that's like good just because I, you know, I'm like good with people or something. Like it just feels so hollow. And it's probably cause my parents are both like blue collar workers. So you're defined by what you get done. Like talking is not work kind of thing. Um, so I, I ended up then spending more time with RoboCop and the work I did in Sunswift changed in my fifth year as I was like, no, I want to become as, as capable as I can as an engineer. So I wish I spent more time on that stuff maybe earlier on at uni because I ended up in a lot of like leadership roles, which was amazing. Like that changed my personality and my capabilities immensely. But I kind of got three years in and was like, I think I'm far too experienced at leadership and management for a 21 year old. And I'm not experienced enough as an engineer, as a 21 year old should be, you know? So I feel like I got that balance slightly wrong, which is funny because like in my second year of uni, I said, there's three things I want to get good at, which is I want to get good at leadership and people. I want to get good at being an engineer and I want to get good at thinking like a business because I think that, you know, being like a good business thinker is really good. So early uni was a lot about the people stuff. And then to the question later on was about more of that technical stuff. But there's not a lot of business things you can do at uni, which is probably why I ended up in the startup space after uni. Um, very classic question that we wanted to ask you. Um, did you ever experience imposter syndrome? If so, how did you deal with it or get over it? This is a complicated one for me to answer because I think there's two things that play generally what I find with people. One is that people feel like they don't fit in because they just don't feel like they're good enough outright as people. And the other one is they feel like they, they want to be good enough, but they're just in like the wrong spot. And the tricky thing with me about imposter syndrome is that I have a, more of an attitude in life of like, I just know I'm not good enough and that's okay. Because imposter syndrome is often talked about like this whole like, oh, you know, like I feel not good enough. And then like I go through a revelation when I realize I'm good enough. I have a job right now and I don't think I do great at it and one day I might lose the job and people won't think I'm good enough and that's life and I'll go find another job I'm probably not good enough at and like we'll get along and as long as I'm like saving money and stuff along the way then I'm probably pretty happy and as long as I'm meeting some nice people. So it's a complicated one for me to answer because I don't think it's as, as clear as like one of those really ambitious uni students that's like you know, I want to like get on top of things and um, I just feel like I'm not a superstar and they are a superstar but you know like even in the startup space is a really good example. I went to an event last night. It was an awards night for different startups. And, you know, we're a startup. You know, we've raised $7 million. Um, you know, we deal with about a half a billion in money. And you feel like really big sometimes with that. And, you know, you're like, oh, this is okay. But then I get to these events and I see these other people there. I see like literal people worth a couple hundred million dollars. I come across a guy called Pasha with a startup that has like a hundred employees and they're serving like a million customers. You know, and I look at them even now and I think, man, that's like unattainable. I'm in this crowd of giants and I can't relate. Like that's not going to be me. I've hit a ceiling. It's just like really normal. It always happens. Like you don't really conquer it. I think you just kind of have to like not think about it sometimes. A good thing I tell people a lot is... Think about where you are now, because the biggest problem is we surround ourselves by very successful people. So you talk like look at uni students, uni students often feel like they're not good enough. But you go out to, you know, poorer parts of Sydney or other parts of Australia and you talk to, you know, people who have really blue collar jobs and you tell them something like in your case that, you know, you're at university, you're studying how to program computers. You spent yesterday like interviewing people on Zoom. They'll like look at you and be like, how did you possibly accomplish that? 
I'm sure you don't sit here right now being like, you know, how fucking great am I, right? You probably just sit here feeling very normal, but that's because we're really bad at self-assessing and we don't see all those like crazy steps that led up to that point because everyone's quite remarkable. They're just at a different point in the journey. So I think, yeah, I experience it all the time, every day. I spent this weekend with extremely incredible bunch of people who'd like sold companies and bought companies. And like, I was eating lunch with a guy who just like knows like Scott and Mike from Atlassian casually and he's like oh they tried to buy my company but i didn't like, nah. <laughs> you know and you're like oh my god like who are you i'm over here you're but you know who knows like you know there's lots of times you won't achieve things you want i always thought i'd be like much sportier than i am i always thought i'd be a much better musician than i am we, we don't get everything we want but usually if you, as long as you're motivated you'll end up doing some exceptional things and it'll just it'll seem very natural in hindsight but right now we can't paint the path so in summary of I try to remind myself that as long as I'm motivated and I'm working things will solve themselves same with like last night I went at this event and I just went and talked to like random people and like even three years ago I would not have had the confidence to talk to strangers at a networking event that I don't know and just like introduce myself and it's like really calm for me now and it's like wow I never set out to do that I never had a goal I've definitely felt like I wasn't good enough for like the business world years ago because I just didn't think I was sociable enough. But just keep working and things will figure themselves out most of the time. It's a bit like paying bills, right? Like I hate paying bills. I hate paying rent. I hate the phone bill. I hate recurring things because I just want to, I just want to, I just want to get over it, you know? Like I hate that kind of crushing feeling of like, I always have to keep paying for things to stay alive. And I find as you get older, you just kind of realize you're like, that's part of life, you know? You just kind of compartmentalize it a little bit and, and get on with the day. Um, so it's a bit like that for me with the imposter stuff. It's like, you're always an imposter. You're always going to feel like that. Don't overthink it. Trust in the past. Cause you know, nearly all of us have come from a place where we might've felt like an imposter. Like think about, you know, a one, five, one, one student feeling like they can't program. And then a ton of people listening to this right now, suddenly they can program. And you're like, you know, you overcame it and you'll keep doing that. Just keep working hard. I generally, I find that if people are focused, if people like have ambition, they like, I want to work hard. Um, and I'm motivated, things will just nearly always sort themselves out. So only be scared if you don't care. That's when you may remain an actual imposter because you won't actually like improve anything in your life. There's some pretty good points you brought up there. Um, only be scared if you don't care. Going into the startup space, I think right now Hayden is quite well known for being a co-founder of Perla. But we went back, um, we stalked his LinkedIn and we noticed that Compare Meals was one of his earlier ventures. So on that note, just to start us off, what started the idea of Compare Meals and why did you steer towards the startup direction after uni? The idea of Compare Meals, um, it's a pretty old startup in the grand scheme of things. I, start, I think we probably properly started around like maybe 2016 and we wrapped up in 2019. The idea was kind of predicated based on the fact that there were all these there was this massive influx of both what we call yeah prepared meals and meal kits um which you're kind of like you know your mind muscle chefs you like re- you know reheat them and then your meal kits which you're like hello fresh marley spoons um they were growing like a astronomical rate in terms of usage um but no one knew about them and there was no kind of place for people to to learn about them frankly and like figure out what might work for them so um, if anyone's used like the website Finder before, um, there might be, there's a web- other websites out there like iSelect for like, you know, electricity and gas. There's websites out there like Mozo for bank accounts and same with Finder. We were trying to build something like that for uh, meal services so that anyone who was like, I want to, I want to help, you know, not prepare my own food. What's the best thing for me? Um, and the business model was pretty simple. We just would put companies on there and then we would charge them for affiliate links and we'd be cheaper than Google because everyone's got ads out there. But if they can pay us money, we make money, but it's cheaper for them than putting Google ads up and that's good for them. It just sounded like a cool idea, like a cool thing to build. It wasn't much more than that. It was just makes sense. I think I can build it. So we tried to build it. It's nothing like, you know, like I was starving and I got a meal and then I was motivated ever since. It just seemed, it just seemed like it made sense. You know, like it was like, oh, this is, yeah. It's, sometimes people tell you this stuff and you're like, huh, Yeah, that makes sense. That's one of the coolest things about the startup community generally is a lot of people just come and tell you ideas and you're like, yeah, like one startup we work with at at UNSW, we're not work with, but like we worked near. They do all of like Woolworths. If you ever ever been to Woolworths and you noticed that in the last year it started to detect what 
fruit you put down. You like put an avocado down and you like tap on fruits of veg and it's like, oh, that's an avocado or something. You know, they, they, they did that, this other startup from UNSW. And it's like, huh, that is a very helpful thing. But yeah, just, it seemed fun. It seemed more fun than like a nine to five job at, at Google in corporate land. You know, I had worked in internships at this point and, you know, big tech is lovely, uh, but it can be a little bit sleepy sometimes, you know, depending on which organization you end up and where you end up in it and where they're up to in their development cycle. For better or for worse, I'm, I'm a bit of a fidgety person. I get really easily bored and distracted. I didn't want to end up in one of those jobs where, like, because I had internships and sometimes you're just waiting for your manager, you're just kind of killing time, you know? And I'm like, I don't really like that. I'd rather be like overwhelmed than underwhelmed, generally. You know? mm. So, yeah. I see, I see. So on the topic of um, stalking your LinkedIn, we noticed something interesting. So we saw that you like to take a fail fast and learn quickly approach to your startups. Would you be able to explain this and go into like how you let this manifest? It's a good question. It might be a bit outdated now that I think about it. You know, that kind of fail fast attitude came out of like big tech from the 90s and 2000s. I think, you know, particularly Google or Facebook or something. The idea of you don't have to get everything perfect day one. Something I've definitely learned in the startup space is not necessarily like fail fast. That's true, but more like learn efficiently. Back to like the whole lean mentality, the like, you know, minimum viable product. You know, if you want to build a big... um, a big system, a big piece of software? How do you build just the tiniest amount? How do you always build the thing that you're like most sure should exist and then talk to people about it to get more confidence on the next thing? Because the worst thing you can do is be really slow in general. Like, you know, take a really long time to perfect something before it's perfect. And then you got the tech mentality of like, just go at it really hard, fail quickly, learn from it. And then I feel like I've nearly learned a bit more about the startup mentality, which is that, but I like to nuance it more and be like, Let's work really quick, but like really targeted along the way, because in startups, you also don't have the luxury of wasting too much time. You kind of, at some point, you can actually fail so fast that you're spending all your time failing. And even just to to fail, you have to do a lot of dev work and that takes up a lot of time. So it's kind of like we want to fail fast or learn quickly, but like, how do we do that without speculating so much as to the work that needs to be done so if we were to build an app for instance it wouldn't be like you know we want to build an app to like find free seats on campus let's like you know build the whole thing and then it will suck and then we'll rebuild it or like rebuild a part of it it's more like let's build like a fake app that just has seats in k17 that doesn't even work and let's show it to a few people and they'll be like oh i like this i hate that and you're like cool then you add the next layer in and you're like you know let's make it actually live seating and then, you know, let's expand that to another building. That really like tick, 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 tick approach along is massive in, in the startup space. So it's how we generally can move very fast. Uh, but it does rely on an acknowledgement that you will break things along the way. It relies on an acknowledgement that sometimes you will trip over yourself later on by having created a problem early. And if you, if you thought about it deeper early, maybe you could have like future-proofed yourself a bit. Um, so there are a few downsides to it, but it tends to suit the startup grind, I, I guess you could say, pretty well, I find. Mm, interesting. Cool, cool. This is one side of maintaining a successful startup. What other skills and attributes do you need to have to maintain a startup over the conventional like good ideas and good management? Frankly, just like smart people and money. Okay. That's really it. Like if you get if you get smart people together like smart, motivated, people are massive. Like you need good people around you. If you ever try and start a company or do a project with that friend you have that you know is like a little bit lazy and unreliable and they don't really care, you really won't ever accomplish anything. So like smart and motivated people are important. The only problem with that alone is that the reality is people need to be paid. You either need people who are like independently wealthy or they're wealthy through their family so that they're happy to like start a company and just not earn any money from that starting phase. Or you need someone else to give you money to pay for people to do that work, right? Um, you know, in my particular case, early on, I, we were neither of those, which is how I ended up teaching at the university. Again, I taught there for many years. So I kind of came back and taught more than I normally did because, you know, I needed to actually pay the rent and save money because, you know, the first three years of our startup, three and a half years, in fact, we didn't earn any money. Um, so I was working for free for three and a half years full time kind of thing. So yeah, you either need to like, you know, work like a horse, which is not fun, 
you know, it wasn't fun doing a lot of that teaching with a startup, or you need to be independently wealthy or, you know, wealth from your family, or you need to have backers who can fund you because you can't just work for three years without earning any money. It doesn't make any sense. Mm, that's very true and very realistic. Moving away from the management side, what is the level of technical depth your employees or I guess people who work for startups in general can explore at a startup? The short answer is that you will get a breadth of understanding at a startup that is unparalleled to a corporate company in terms of like you get exposed to all these different kinds of things. And it's just because it's smaller. As a company gets bigger, people get, you know, sectioned off into smaller and smaller silos but the downside of that there's two big downsides one is that you rarely in a startup rarely get a sense of scale you go to google you make a change it might be deployed to like a million people the next day you don't really get that at a startup everything's quite tiny in a startup and there's a lot of genuine learning like really genuine learning from engineering that comes from scale and then the second thing is probably reliability which is kind of tied to scale like you know Startups are less concerned with testing, they're less concerned with reliability, which I guess you could call scale too, because, you know, a lot of a lot of reliability kind of matters at scale. So maybe I can just kind of keep it at scale is the biggest thing, which, you know, I miss it sometimes because scale is like one of the most important parts of engineering, right? Like you think, can you build a car? Okay, I can build a car maybe. Can you build a car where, can you build a factory that's producing a thousand cars an hour? It's like, oh God, all the rules change at that point. You know, um, that's actually hard now. So scale's amazing. I hope I end up working in a large company again someday. And I kind of wish I did more. It's not quite right for me at the moment, but there's pros and cons to both. But basically everything that isn't scale, you probably learn a lot more in, in a startup is if I had to give a really short answer. It doesn't work well for people who are really like nitpicky or... Um, quite compulsive about getting everything perfect they tend to struggle in the environment Um, it's really good for those types that are like you know 80% is good enough let's keep going it seems that there's quite a bit to take on at a startup Um, as you said you get to know a lot and probably in more depth as well um, simply because of the nature of startups but also what is important is that like in every learning process the student or the learner is supported Um, on that note Do you have mentorship at your company and how do you ensure that it happens? Oh, it's a good question. You know, probably, probably not as much as we'd like. Um, There's no structure to it. You know, you go to a big tech company and you know, they'll have mentors or um, mentoring programs, but you know, the kind of nature of a startup again is like, I'd say that it feels like there's a lot of implicit mentoring a lot of the time. Like it's not a lot of structure to it, but you work with people who are smarter or more capable than you and people work for you who are you know you're smarter and more capable of them um and if you're working together and you're trying to achieve a goal you just learn a lot from people you know like we hire people who are more senior than me um i work with my co-founder who's older than me and i learn a lot from them all the time i feel like as long as as long as there's good interesting work to do and there's a lot of respect around um the mentorship kind of happens but you know as you scale as a company you hire more diverse you know types of people and stuff um you do need to create more structures around that for sure it does tie back into like how you said that the type of employees you hire are quite important. So we've cut over a lot about the startup space. What did you find the most daunting during the launch and maintenance of a startup? Uh, I'm going to have a bit of a specific answer here because I run a financial services company. So it's just dealing with money. You know, 90% of the stress is the money for sure, if not more. Like, Sometimes I yearn to be one of those companies where, you know, you think about like, I don't know why, but dating apps always come to mind because they're some of the biggest, you know, companies that are just like really simple. You know, you go look at like big, big companies and they're often, um, I mean, Canva might be another example. Like, I really like these companies sometimes to just build software. It sounds really fun. The risk is pretty low. Like, what are you going to do? Lose someone's like dating profile, lose someone's like Canva designs. I'm not saying it's easy. Obviously, it's like the furthest thing from it, but... The thing that um, is most daunting for me is the fact that we carry, you know, risk with people's money, personal information. You know, there are things we can get wrong and we, you know, we endeavor not to and we don't really get them wrong. So, yeah, that's by far the biggest stressor for my company, Perla. On that note, what would you say are then the most rewarding aspects? Like, surely if there's a great risk, there comes a great reward. Oh, I mean, you know, it's, it's helping customers. 
um, and it's seeing the impact you have. I mean, you know, most people get into startups because of, you know, there's probably two reasons I see. One is um, empowerment. They enjoy that it's a small organization where they feel very empowered or it's two, it's impact. It's, you know, being able to um, just, you know, know how critical they are in the cog of things, you know, to be one of 10 people who, um, you know, it's like a startup I heard from last night. They do like AI on um, medical scans and stuff, you know, and they're talking about like they'd save lives because of like their AI detected cancers that doctors didn't. It's like, you know, that's the most rewarding part. We don't help stop cancer. Um, but, you know, seeing people who, you know, would otherwise not invest or not save, um, do it or feel more comfortable with it. You know, you can have, you can genuinely set people on a path that's going to have a material impact on, you know, their financial future. So that's pretty like massive as far as I'm concerned. Um, just impacts the absolute short answer there. Yes. So as your startup grows, how do you know which responsibilities you need to release and take on as your startup grows? I guess from a more like high level managerial perspective. How do I learn? I mean, just through trial and error. I think there's two rules that govern a lot of what happens. First one is that you want to delegate as much responsibility as humanly possible all the time unless it inhibits the growth or the progress of the business. Because the problem with like a startup is that if the business doesn't do well, no one wins. Like it doesn't matter how cute your organization structure is. It doesn't matter how, you know, empowered everyone feels. If you lose money or you don't raise more money or you have to like fire staff, like that's all people are going to remember. So my attitude is like, if I can delegate something without a loss in quality or progress, then like, let's do it. Because I don't really care. Like I don't have an ego with it. I don't need to be part of it, <coughs> but I have a responsibility to the business. So um, it's a bit of a high level answer, but that's kind of the principles that I'd say inform that. All right. So um, that was the end of our venture into the startup space briefly with Hayden. Um, we also have another part. It is going to be about Hayden's experience in the teaching sector. You have quite an extensive teaching experience. Um, what made you go into teaching and what did you find attractive about it? You know, I started teaching like 10 years ago now. Jeez. Um, wow. Don't know why. <laughs> no, I think, um, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's fun to educate. I don't know anyone, honestly, that doesn't enjoy helping people learn. Sometimes they might find it a, an intimidating or scary activity, but it's always fun and helpful. I mean, when I first started tutoring, I was extremely poor too. So I was thrilled to have a job that paid me money. And it was, it was one that I felt like was fun and rewarding, but I also learned a lot. Yeah. Back in my earliest days of tutoring, I was thrilled, felt like I'd, I was getting the best of everything. Cool. Cool. Um, in that case, um, it's been a hot minute um, since you started teaching. What is keeping you in the education and teaching field? There's no real reason to leave. I mean, I can juggle what I do with my job. I'm pretty experienced at it at UNSW. And it, it's a great way to just kind of stay in touch with both some more fundamental technical knowledge, um, as well as just meeting a whole bunch of incredible young people. You know, you meet many and many you don't know, but sometimes, you know, you end up working with them later or you become friends with them later, you know? Like, it's like a whole bunch of things that can happen. And that's really nice, particularly when some of them now, you know, I talk to regularly, some of them I've ended up working with, some of them ended up, like, hiring. It's, like, just a great way to stay connected to a community that's very relevant to, you know, the work I do and, and my history as well. It does require so much time commitment, but you said, like, you can balance it fine, which is, like, okay... Cool, whatever yeah. works for you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, I can balance less nowadays than I have been able to in the past because work's busier, but it's also more manageable than it would have been in the past because in the past, you know, I was had to learn a lot, whereas now things are pretty cruisy in the teaching space at CSE for me. Mm, I see. Again, you spent like quite a long time in the teaching field. How would you say you measure your development and teaching ability? I talk to tutors a lot. I talk to students a lot. I have a pretty good feel of it. Like I know when we're fucking up. I know when we're succeeding. We're always doing things substandard. I don't think I've ever had a problem seeing it or measuring it in my head. You just got to look and pay attention, you know? Talk to students. They'll talk to each other. You'll talk to someone. This is one of the benefits about being in the community too is like I know nearly everyone. Not, you know, not literally, but you know what I mean? Like you talk to people all the time. Um, information is not a hard thing to extract. Um, Having the time 
or capacity or even a solution to, to solve some things is the problem. But the measuring of the ability is pretty easy. You know, you have good terms, you have bad terms. <coughs> you can make improvements to courses, regressions to courses. Um, yeah. Um, you say you're quite involved in the community. Where would you say you get most involved? What are you involved in? And also, what do you think about the community? Oh, I mean, I don't know if I, I'd consider myself, you know, like super involved in it. I mean, it's pretty simple. Like, I've nearly taught at some point, like, I, I don't know the numbers, but let's say that I have taught every undergrad on average for 1.5 courses for the last three years or, you know, I'm sure I've taught on average, like, you know, every student once, bar some exceptions, you know, for um, years now. So, you know, you know people through that and then, you know, more students talk to older students who know you and then you bump into them and because you're, I think, more well-known, it's much easier for people to talk to you and email you and then you, you deal with everything, like, you know, you deal with all the special considerations and the students' issues. They email you, you see the stuff on the forum. It's just, it's just a lot of info. So I don't feel like I'm part of the community because I'm some good community member who's out there kind of, you know, like helping people out every day. I just feel like I, I'm at least intellectually quite ingrained in it. Particularly too, because I, I think I, I said this to someone a while ago. It's like, I pretty much know every CSC SOC co-pres for the last 10 years, or like the last, you know, 11 years worth. You know, and you meet some through other ones as well. And same with the execs and therefore, you know, and then a bunch of stew reps, you know, as well, because you taught them. So then you talk to the stew reps. It's just kind of like it all tumbleweeds quite a lot. So maybe I don't feel like I'm an active participant in the community, but I feel like I'm quite in touch with a lot of what's going on. And, you know, people talk to you about other courses as well. So, you know, it's nice to kind of have a, lot, a good sense of what's going on everywhere. So amongst all the input that you received from students, what are some key things you have learned from teaching? Oh, there's so much. Oh, you can go through all of them if you'd like. No worries. <laughs> teaching, the fundamentals aren't too crazy. You know, like how to communicate a concept for me hasn't been too different for a while. You know, you have to, you have to articulate the why. Um, you know, you explain things visually, you tell a story, um, use examples, use counterexamples, like all this kind of stuff, you, you know, I, I learned quickly in my late teens early 20s right um probably most of the stuff <coughs> in the last years has been understanding students because dealing with students at scale it's, it's it's a hugely different thing to run a course than it is to like tutor a class tutoring a class you're in a bubble with them your job is to you know teach them some concepts but you know when you run a course you learn a lot about who actually reads any emails for instance you know <laughs> um who actually pays attention you know, and here's a good example. Take a course like Comp 6080. Students say, the assignment is too much work. So you go, okay, fair enough. Um, it's probably not worth 20%. Maybe it should be worth 30%. You know, it's like a big assignment. It's got a lot of, lot of learning outcomes in it. So you think, oh, okay, I was probably stressing them out, making them do all this work for 20%. You make it 30%. Next term, they get even more stressed. You get even more, you know, anxiety and confusion because... You'd think it's intuitive that you say, hey, for the same amount of work, I'm actually going to give you like 50% more marks, you know, so your work to mark ratio is actually like dropped by a third. But they actually get more stressed now because the pressure like, you know, per unit effort of how that translates much higher, which is kind of very counterintuitive to me. Basically, it's like students are, and I say this with the, the deepest amount of love, Students are, you know, are anxious, you know, irrational and short-sighted in the large part. And that's not their fault. It's because, like, they don't care. They don't think about it as much as you. They just want to get on with the day. So, there's a lot of things that you think, like, I'll do this and they'll get it. And it's like, not really. And another good example is that, take, like, 1531. You know, we used to have, um, say, labs due on a, a Friday. You know, and then you have late penalties towards Monday. I think I've talked about this a bunch of times. And then students say, I'm too stressed. The late penalties stress out my weekend. So, then you say, oh... That's fine. No late penalties. Well, actually, like, you can submit it up till Monday afternoon. You can have that whole time. But we can't make it due any later, so we'll remove late penalties. So then everyone that term says amazing. Everyone next term says amazing because they all talk to their peers who did the course previously. But the next term, everyone's angry now because they're like, why is it due on a Monday at a hard deadline? Why don't we have more time? Why are there no late penalties? And you're like, well, there were... 
Um, and we actually made it due much later, but you know, so, and so when I mentioned stuff about like the short side and they don't give a lot of time, that's not as in like they're, they're dumb or they don't care. It's more like, you know, you're there, you got all this context, you know, and there's definitely some kind of adversarial relationship sometimes between students and staff where, you know, they don't assume good intent always. And that's because, you know, not all staff members seem like they might have good intent or they might, you know, express some micro behaviors that make students distrust them potentially. It's a lot of those little things. Like it's about how a student's going to react to it. You know, I gave this talk a long time ago that was called like managing young people's moods at scale. And I still think to this day, like I don't really consider myself an educator or having learned a ton in education because I learned a lot through six years of tutoring, you know, like 10 hours a week. But I feel like what I've learned as a lecturer is really about how to efficiently at scale help everyone feel calm and come along the journey you know, and to like communicate to them and be like, you know, this, this is fun. This is why we're doing it. Um, everything's okay. Everything's organized. Don't stress. Um, that's probably where most of my learning has come from in the last few years. Yeah, I would agree that you are achieving your goals, I think. What is your attitude behind being so accommodating towards students in terms of like deadlines, waitings, yeah, changing up those <clears throat> things? I don't know. It's my job. Christ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm employed to educate people in the least stressful way possible. We need them to learn something and we want them to have as good a time as they possibly can during. I'm not there to make people happy. I mean, keeping students happy and hitting learning outcomes are, you know, contrary to what some people might say. In my opinion, they're not, they're not always aligned, right? There's a certain amount of hardship that comes from, it's like even group work. I mean, God, I run like the biggest group work course in CSE. You know, if we wanted to make everyone happy, we'd cut the group work out, right? <laughs> But like we don't, we want them to be exposed to some things. And yeah, occasionally there's there's the oddballs that experience quite a lot of pain for it and we do our best with them. But mostly it's just trying to help them. If there's little improvements we can make. A good example is like in 1531, like we introduced the leaderboard, I think like four terms ago. You know, I modified our auto marker and I wrote a little React app. It took me like an hour because I was like, you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we could give students enough information before submission that they could find some comfort of the general progress they're at without giving them kind of so much information as happens in some other courses where you remove that actual friction of like them having to figure out their own problems, right? There are courses that give students the test before submission. So students know at the point of submission if they've succeeded and like that's not a great outcome educationally in my opinion. Um, so sometimes it's just nice. It's nice to do those things where you're like, yeah, okay, we've helped people out here without undermining our purpose. It's just a lot of that term after term really. Mm, okay. Just your job makes sense. Speaking of your job, um, COVID um, was quite a big happening over the past year or two. Um, a big how, happening. Uh, uh, yes. Oh, cool. would you reword yeah, it? Oh, okay. It was no, I like quite big happening. I think that's that's a good description. <laughs> um, how has your teaching style evolved over time, or was it impacted a lot by COVID? Yeah, I mean, basically students who started uni in 2020 have a fundamental different relationship with everything than they did before 2020 or after because on average you know not everyone there's always outliers everywhere but you know uni's been changing for a long time it used to be like you came to a lecture and if you didn't turn up to the lecture at unsw campus you didn't learn the content and you were screwed and then they started recording the audio of lectures and that was all well and good but they're like you should try listening to the audio of a 1531 lecture and learn anything it's really hard it's like a last resort. It's like I ended up in hospital. It's better than nothing. You know, and then they started screen recording. It's like, okay, that's great. Nothing much technologically has changed since maybe like 2016 or something when they started recording screens. The default's kind of gone from like, I don't have to do the thing and I'm going to opt in to like, I should do the thing and I'll opt out. And we see this even with students, you know. Students, like there's a record low amount of lecture attendance, I find. When people are at home, they meet less... Friends is another problem. Like a big part of uni is leaning on other people. It's a huge part of uni. Some people lean on other people uh, because they're in social groups and there's like an exchange for it. Frankly, there's a lot of people out there who, not a lot, but there's some people out there who, you know, they make friends at uni and they just kind of can exploit those relationships and get like help for it. And this kind of changed the dynamic because students used to rely on each other a lot more. And they'd be motivated too, I find. Like when you're around campus, around all these other people, you want to try hard. You know, when you see people in a lab late working on stuff, like my time at uni was people sitting in the CSE labs till 10, 11 o'clock at night. Wow. You know? And I'm not saying they worked harder. Uh, that's not the point. It's like when you're around that, you want to be better and you want to do better. 
And I think there's a huge element where when you're sitting at home for, you know, more so now on average, it's, you know, you're in a little bubble, you're just kind of sad. You don't have that inspiring environment around you. I think the environment is just a little less conducive to like some more intrinsic motivation that previously existed. And therefore there's just a lot more help that's needed. I mean, this has always been the case. I used to teach online before COVID and like people were just more lonely and it, it impacted their outcomes. So yeah, point is that to the question, you know, how did it change? Um, we just had to support more. We had to like give more help per unit time, per unit student. Um, because they wouldn't otherwise have met the same outcomes we found. Whether that was more help sessions, whether that was how we changed how the lab times worked, whether we, we made more resources, there's just more, 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 more than there was previously. I'd, I'd say that'd be probably my shortest long answer. Nice, thank you for your shortest long answer. We're going to jump back, I guess, to the experience that you've had okay i'm not going to recite this whole list of subjects but basically hayden has tutored quite a bit and has been a lecturer in charge for quite a bit as well of those ones which subjects did you find relatively challenging to teach and why i don't know all of them um all of them let's look at the lecturing part i'm not going to go through the tutoring subjects because they're pretty extensive Comp 1911, which is like the watered down 1511, barely watered down. That's hard to teach because it's your first exposure to computing. You have to ask yourself really freaking fundamental questions like, how do I explain what an if statement is or what a variable is, right? It's really hard to think uh, so empirically. <clears throat> Comp 1531 is hard because we touch on so many fundamental concepts and not all of them are related some of them are quite orthogonal to one another so there's like a volume there and it's there's a, it's like a real breadth subject <coughs> and there's group work so there's a content problem and a group work problem that you have to overcome the c plus plus course i taught for a while comp 6771 that's a challenging course to teach because c plus plus is a really hard language to do live coding in the errors are really obscure the examples you're working with are quite complicated there's also like a million questions students can ask. Like, what if this? What if that? What's happening here? What's going on there? Can you do this? So that that course was always stressful because you are constantly playing a game of basically just being like, I don't know, in the middle of a lecture and having to navigate that. That one was always quite stressful to lecture. Comp 6080 is always stressful to lecture because every answer in front end begs another three questions because it's such a broad area. Like you could do an entire university degree just focused on web-based software development. So you kind of don't have this convergence that's really nice in normal subjects where you teach. 1511 is such a fun course to teach because you just you just teach C and it's just C and that's like it. Whereas like, you know, JavaScript even itself is a painful language to teach because everything you can do it in other two ways and three ways. And then there's this other example on the internet. And you don't really feel like you just start from broad and you come in. You kind of start here and you just kind of keep getting broader while you're coming in. And it's a bit of a roller coaster. Comp 2521 is hard to teach because the concepts are hard. Nothing scares me more than trying to do like a live code of a quick sort or something. It's just like, you know, you know, hats off to Comp 2521 tutors because... In pretty much every other course I've taught, if a student comes up to you and is like, my code doesn't work, if you're quite experienced, you can usually just like look at it and figure out what's wrong. Someone comes up to you with like a 30 line recursive merge sort and is like, my merge sort doesn't work. It's like, oh God. <laughs> you know, so it's, I find that course is very stressful because the, the concepts are very hard and that translates into quite difficult code. Um, and I think they're the main courses I've lectured for undergrad and postgrad. Yeah. There's my little hit list. Mm. Okay, cool. So in terms of like getting involved with the community um, and just taking on student feedback in general, we wanted to ask you, um, how much of my experience do you actually take seriously? No, I never read that shit. Oh, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> right. no. I read it a lot. Um, I don't do well with the positive comments because, I don't know, I don't like it. <laughs> um, I usually get someone else to read, to like look through the positive ones for me and tell me any highlights. Um, but it's super useful. Like, I don't like how late my experience comes back to staff. It comes out like a week before the next term's meant to start. So you can, it's so hard to do anything with it. Mm. But, you know, but also you already know what you're doing mostly. I find it a very bittersweet time because most of the good feedback that you can do something about, you've already done something about. Then there's a small section of stuff that is really easy to fix and you can just fix it. It's like people don't like something that you don't think you can change or that they've misunderstood. And you're like, oh, 
like you have people feel like my experience being like you know oh, i'm so annoyed i wish there was a lecture on this and you're like there was a lecture on this it's in week eight and you feel bad you don't like you're like stupid you just you just get sad because you're like because you don't get this feedback till like these like weeks after the course ends and you're like i wish we could have just helped you in the moment you know or other times you know students will say like the course is too the course is too hard and you want to be able to figure out how to talk to them and be like you know i think it's okay i wish we could have had honest conversations about what course might have been appropriate for your background at your stage of the degree or how you, we could have given you more support because it's not too hard but you know it's like something can be the right level of difficulty without the right support so i do absolutely read a lot of it and i take a lot of it very seriously how much of it's actionable can be hard but mostly i actually, it's one of the saddest days of my freaking year to be honest because you just read through it and you're like you just feel all this like negativity and sad like not with everyone right typically most people aren't feeling that way but you feel a lot of it and the stuff you are changing you're like cool you know you feel very empowered and the stuff that you can't change or, or don't think you should change and or, or yeah it's, it's just a bit of a depressing few hours i find i usually try and read it in the morning because if i read it too late at night i don't sleep that night usually very well so just like read it in the morning mull over it during the day and i talk to people about it, it's the main thing people i often send out these notices at the end of my courses you know and they're very much like about trying to empower people to like not to make people feel empowered by the feedback they give so they feel like they were listened to but about 30 percent of the reasons just so i can get some freaking closure and sleep you know, it's like, oh, okay, I wrote it all down. It's all done now. It's like when people say, like, write down all the things you... Write down all the pros and cons about this decision. It's like that. You're just like, oh, it's down on paper now. Out of the head. I think that is quite a human aspect of the, my experience. Okay, so um, would you say teaching skills are innate or learned? And if you think they are learned, um, how can beginning or current teachers improve? I don't know of many skills that are innate. I feel like most, pretty much everything's learned. I think I think the question is that some people just don't learn very well, frankly. <laughs> like, I've worked with people, and this has been, like, a gripe of mine. Like, sometimes you, you meet people and you, like, think they're going to learn and they just don't. Like, some people just hit a ceiling. I mean, we probably all hit a ceiling at some point, but no, I feel like it's all learned. You know, people say stuff's innate, but, you know, we're all learning from our family, our teachers, our environments, our communities, our friends, our bullies. <laughs> Our, our partners like whatever there's always like a lot going on that shapes who you are so i think it's all learned i think it's just a question of where you learned it from but to the question of how can beginning or current teachers improve it's hard like it's a hard question to answer because there's a lot more at play here you know like at unsw for instance you know a lot of teachers are full-time staff that means that you know i don't want to say they're incentivized to spend less time working but if i work more I get paid more. If I work less, I get paid less. I'm a casual. So I think casuals generally are fairly well incentivized to be good teachers in the short term. That being said, you know, like full-time staff have an incentive to, uh, to optimize things because if they can make a course run smoother, they actually save more time because they don't suddenly have other work to do. Whereas like me, if I spend less time on something, I kind of have to find other work. So it's very complicated and because so therefore I don't want to be like oh they just have to care more or spend more time because like sometimes the incentives aren't aligned to spend more time sometimes the incentives are aligned to spend less time for instance but yeah I don't know how can teachers improve generally I mean in the context of I'd hate to give anyone a lecture about being a lecturer or running a course but just spending more time on something is probably the biggest thing trying something out most of the time like when you really bubble into it most of the issues you see with how courses are run generally are immaturity and that usually comes from when you get really young teaching staff involved less so like the mature teaching staff um, or it comes from just like a lack of time or attention you know and I've been there like I'm much busier these days than I used to be and I feel like I flirt on the edge about how much headspace can I give things you know you only want to half solve problems because you don't have time to or maybe maybe you solve a problem but it's too late but it's hard to again I know I'm not giving you an answer but it's like Here's another problem. Students generally don't work during business hours. I don't know what they do sometimes. <laughs> you know, like they sleep in and then they like maybe watch a bit of class and then they do their work in the evening and the weekend. And then they're like, no one's around. The lecturer is not here to solve our problems. And it's like most teaching staff have freaking families. They're not sitting around like me on a Saturday looking at their inbox, you know. It's just hard. It's like it's, there's just so much to unpack because... 
there's a lot that I think, you know, students could do about how they approach their studies. I don't think that's the major thing. There's a lot about how motivated lecturers could be in, intrinsically or how much the institution can do to motivate or incentivize them. There's some structural things we could do to improve courses that make it easier to teach. Um, there's financial constraints on all of this, like how much time, does, how much money does the uni actually have to spend on tutors? What a terrible way to answer one of the last questions, but I just feel like it's very complex and there's just a lot for everyone to do, for sure. I see. I guess beginning and current teachers can then just try to get better, try to get <laughs> Yeah, try to get better. You just keep working. That's like what I said at the start, like... You know, I get better at it the more I do. I wouldn't have been able to start lecturing okay if I didn't do the tutoring. I had the benefit of being at UNSW already. I had the benefit of spending years in Sunswift. It all stacks up. Everyone's only as good as the history they've had behind them. So you just got to keep going. And, you know, most smart people will, will get there if they just keep going. Oh, I think this ties back in very nicely with our imposter syndrome um, answer, which was just do what you can and don't not put an effort which also yep. brings us to the end. So we have some closing questions for you. We've covered two main fields in your life. What other industries would you steer towards in the future? Oh, this changes. Sometimes I see my friends go into like high speed trading within university after computer science. And I think, oh, that sounds like a lot of money. I could do that. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a point. I have a point where you could pay me to do anything. I thought seriously about going and getting a job in the mines years ago when in I heard how much money they make. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, like, no, really, I mean, you, you work like a $400,000 salary for four years in your 20s and you'll never be stressed about money in your life if you don't spend it. You know what I mean? Like, that was a tangent. Sorry, let's <laughs> move off that. I've always liked other types of engineering. It was just never as fun as computing. You know, I have lots of friends who go into companies like, you know, Airbus or, you know, Tesla. You know, they get to do stuff, you know? Like, there's a, there's still a big part of me that doesn't want life to be turning up to an air-conditioned office looking at Jira. <laughs> you know, like, at some point it has to burrow the soul out of you as opposed to, you know, I, I gave that example earlier about, like, manufacturing cars. Like, it'd be incredible to be part of a team that put together some of the first, like, Tesla Model 3 plants that went from, you know, like, a 1,000 cars a month to, like, 50,000 cars a month or whatever it was. Um, there's something just very real about that. Like, it's very kind of cliched, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to get away from the desk, frankly, at least for half part of my job. That doesn't mean away from software. I always kind of thought my future would be a software developer in a non-software space, like an autonomous car or like, um, you know, aviation or something, you know, like working at Qantas doing route planning where they tackle problems like, can we fly a slightly different route based on the winds and the weather and the timing to save 1% of fuel, something like that. Sometimes I, I miss that. Like, you know, my experience has been a lot of like software, 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 like pure software. It'd be fun to do something practical. Hopefully one day you can explore those horizons. The last closing question is for our uni students out there who are tuning in. If you could go back to your uni self, what would be the advice you'd give? It's like, I have a very personal answer, which, you know, I, I think I mentioned it during the last AMA actually, which was like, you know, stop spending, stop, you know, spending so much time trying to take care of other people. But that's a useless answer because that's a very personal answer to me. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. most people aren't going to look at that and be like, yeah, it's a good point, you know? Um, and, you know, I couldn't unpack what I mean by that in an hour, let, you know, let alone a minute. But if I could answer it maybe more broadly and be like, you know, I've spent a lot of time around other students and I've seen a lot of them go through and people regret things or not regret things or, or, you know, go through all different types of journeys. I'd probably say the advice would have to be to just keep going. Um, as long as you're moving forward, like keep moving forward with everything. Um, this isn't some, you know, I, I get typecast sometimes as this like somewhat robotic alien, like workaholic creature. Um, but I just love, working hard on stuff and like honestly sometimes like I went through an obsession two months ago where all I could do for like three evenings in a row was try and make like a creme brulee myself in the oven because I was like I want to get good at this I want to do well at this and other times I've been like you know what I'm going to do the best Christmas ever 
and I'm going to find the 10 most important people to me and I'm going to buy them all presents and I'm going to write them all cards and I'm going to be like a good person to them this year. It doesn't, it's, I'm not talking about professionalism stuff when I say that, like, just do your best. It doesn't matter what. Like, if you keep doing your best at whatever the hell you want to do at any given time, um, I've found just consistently those people get carried to good places. Personally, professionally, emotionally, like, whatever else. So, I felt like I did that a lot during uni myself. So, like, it, that's why it's a bit harder for me to be like, that's the advice I give me. Um, but just at mass, when I talk to people, that's probably the thing I say is like, just, just keep going and don't feel like that saying you have to go get three internships. It's like, start running, get fit, you know, eat better, sleep better. Like, don't just, just live every day with as high a degree of conviction as your mental health will allow you to at that given point in time. And, and yeah, it'll figure itself out. Mm, nice. So guys, keep at it. You can do it. Thank you for joining us, Hayden. Um, I hope you had as much fun as I did and as the listeners right now. I think we will wrap it up here, but anything else you'd like to say? No, thank you for the time. Had a lot of fun. Um, and that wraps up the end of our Echo podcast. Check us out on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Discord. Yeah, okay, bye. <laughs>